Nyajo Milwaukee and welcome to a March edition of Nyajo Milwaukee TV. I am Malia Zhang. The word Nyajo means hello in the Hmong language. It is used to welcome or greet people. So Nyajo and welcome again to our show. Today we'll take you to meet Yilin Zhang, elected board trustee for the Western Village, Wisconsin Board of Trustees, and executive director and youth coordinator of Hmong American Center in Wausau, Wisconsin. We will join in on a Landmark Credit Union home buying seminar for some quick home buying tips and also, we continue our health conversation with the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association of the Medical College of Wisconsin. Today's topic will be about alcoholism. In addition, Dr. Chia Vane joins us in the studio to talk about her new book, Fly Until You Die. Along with these great stories, we'll have important news within the Hmong community to announce and share with you pieces of our rich and colorful culture. At the age of 19, he was elected to the D.C. Everest School Board in 2014, in 2016, elected to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors, and in 2018, elected to the Village of Weston Board of Trustees. As the youngest Hmong elected official in the state of Wisconsin, Yiling Zhang is getting an early start to a political career. Let's go see what he has to say about his passion to serve. Well, my name is Yiling Zhang. Um, I am currently the Marathon County Board Supervisor representing District 19, a member of the Village Board of Trustees, and a member of the V. Service School District. Um, I currently chair the uh, Diversity Affairs Commission in Marathon County, and I'm also the chair of the Parks and Recreation Committee for the Village of Weston, and the Vice Chair of the Public Safety Committee for the uh, Village of Weston and I'm the executive director of the, of the Hmong American Center in Wausau, Wisconsin. My passion has always been to serve the community. I've gotten to the point where I wanted to give back to the community in some way, somehow. And I've always had an interest in politics and I've always thought about running for office. And I finally made the decision to run for office in 2014 when I ran for the DC Everest School Board position at the age of 19. Uh, it was four candidates, four of us. Um, the fourth, can the other candidate actually dropped out and endorsed me for the campaign. One of them has been on the, for the, on the board for 27 years. So um, ultimately, in the end, I ended up defeating her and taking her seat on the school board. Um, I wanted to serve my community through that capacity, and through then, uh, I was approached by a former uh, administ the county administrator, and at that time, the county supervisor of District 19, Mort McBain, who approached me and asked me if I would be interested in running to represent the residents of District 19 on the Marathon County Board, and I wanted to make sure that the village, the Kara County Board had um, a Hmong perspective or minority perspective on the board, so I made the ultimate decision to run for that position. Talk a little bit about that moment in your life that you said, you know what, I want to get into government. Sure. So it's really interesting because back in 2012, when I was still in high school and I was the youth board president for the uh, youth club there, I still remember when the dance team specifically had a their banner over the Hmong Pandona, you know, our uh, Hmong quotes in the commons area in the, uh, the, in the school district. And I remember a lot of the students were approaching me and they were telling me, Yi, you have to do something. You have to do something. You're the president of the Hmong club. And at that time, I ended up going and approaching the dance teacher and talking with her and explaining to her why it was offensive, you know, why it was a concern, and she removed it down. So, you know, when I made the decision to go into government, I felt the same exact same thing. I wanted to be that voice for those individuals that couldn't speak on behalf of themselves. I wanted to represent those individuals. I wanted to be able to uh, speak on their behalf and make sure their voices was heard. I was born in Wausau, Wisconsin, and obviously when I was going through the system, there was a lot of bullying that happened. You know, um, there was incidents where, you know, the non Hmong students would, you know, pick on you because you were the quiet Hmong student in class because I wanted to focus on my education and I, I always remember that my greatest achievement I personally thought was in 12th grade when I was able to tell my childhood bully to shut up <laughs> you know that was my biggest uh, I felt was my biggest accomplishment because I was never able to speak for you know against this individual but once I started to get involved I started to speak on behalf of other people it built the courage for myself to be able to speak and protect myself as well. With the Hmong community, we're very unique compared to any other race out there. I think uh, Mayor Steve Lee put it best, you know, we as a Hmong community, wherever we, wherever we go, as long as we have the name Hmong, um, we're able to connect with them somehow. I remember I went to Michigan this past year and I, uh, and I didn't know anybody when I went there, but when I came back, I knew dozens of individuals already just because of the fact that we had one relating aspect, which was that we were Hmong. You know, working with 
the community at large. I've always said this numerous amount of time. If we were to compare the Hmong community with the other race or the other ethnic out there in the uh, category of um, you know education, obviously we are we do not has have as much as uh, individuals who are as educated as other races. If we were to com compare wealth, obviously the other races are more wealthier than we are. But what's very interesting is that the other individuals or the other races or what they fear about the Hmong community or what they respect about the Hmong community is the fact that we have that family bond, our ability to unite together under the name Hmong, under the call of unity. So, you know, I, I felt the need that in order for us to become successful, in order to continue this, we have to continue supporting each other, no matter where we live, no matter where we reside, you know, we have to continue supporting whatever program that's coming up as long as for the greater good. Thank you, Lang, for sharing your story. Your commitment and drive to serve will pave the way and set good examples for our community to follow. Most things in life come with a price. And it's one that you're willing to pay. But you'd never say it costs too little. Which is why we offer straightforward options for your everyday financial needs with better rates and lower fees so you have more money for the things that really matter. Landmark Credit Union, you're worth more here. Welcome back to Nyojo, Milwaukee. Here's what's going on in our Hmong community. Congratulations to Kyrie Yang and her family on becoming the first Hmong Gerber baby. Kyrie beat out more than half of a million babies to become Gerber's spokesbaby. According to CEO of Gerber, Kyrie was chosen because of the wide eye curiosity and the look of wonder in her eyes. Kyrie's parents are Ying Vu and Peter Yang, and they reside in North Carolina. The Sacagawea Award was created in 1982 to recognize two trailblazing women who exhibit the spirit of Sacagawea. The award is named for the Native American woman who helped guide Lewis and Clark on their legendary 1804-1806 search for the Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean. Congratulations to Mai Zhe Tao for being the first Hmong woman to receive the Sacagawea Award, along with Janet Mitchell. Both were chosen through their career accomplishments, commitment to the community, and support for women's advancement. Hmong Kaxia in Madison celebrated a new location on Friday, March 8th at the Life Center Madison. They held a grand opening so the community members can tour the new location, network, and meet staffs and elders. For more information about Hmong Kaxia, contact Lo Pao Bang at 608-471-3634 or email mongkaxiamadison at gmail.com. The United Hmong American Association hosted a two-day event on March 15th and 16th at the DJ Borgini Center in Appleton, Wisconsin. Youth from the Fox Valley joined in on the educational conference for high school and college students. Students were exposed to different career paths and professional mentors. The Milwaukee Consortium for Hmong Health will be hosting their fourth annual health conference Saturday, April 6th at the Italian Community Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The theme is Empowering Families saving lives through education and screening. It is a free event and is open to all ages. There will be interactive workshops by health experts, free health screenings, and individuals for you to talk to to learn about how to get into the health profession. Interpretation services are available in Hmong, Lao, Burmese, Karini, and Karen. For more information, you can contact Maihua Moa at 414-446-9209 or email mchhconference at gmail.com. Join Lotus Legal Clinic next month on April 24, 2019, and wear denim as a visible sign to be a supporter and make a social statement to encourage open discussion about how to reduce violence in communities. The Denim Day campaign was triggered by a ruling from the Italian Supreme Court when a rape conviction was overturned. The justices decided that since the victim was wearing tight jeans, she must have helped the rapist remove her jeans, thereby implying consent. The following day, women in the Italian parliament wore jeans to work in solidarity with the victim. Since then, wearing jeans on Denim Day had become a symbol of protest against destructive attitudes about sexual assaults, including victim blaming. If you are a survivor, know that you are not alone. Lotus Leo Clinic is here to help with free legal services, advocacy, and community education to empower survivors. On February 20th, Landmark Credit Union hosted a free home buying seminar at their Milwaukee South branch. The seminars gave community advices on obtaining a loan, looking for a home, and importance of home inspection. What's a home inspection? Why do you get one? Do you have to get one? 
Why do you get one? Any idea? Sir? To know what you're buying. To know what you're buying. Because when you go in there, what do you look at? Oh, wow, I love the way this kitchen's set up. Oh, the bathroom looks so great. I can see my bed here. You look at things that we don't look at, and vice versa. My name is Christina Munoz, and I'm a mortgage loan officer. We hope that by attending one of our first-time homebuyer seminars, uh, people are going to leave uh, having a little bit more of a, an understanding of what a mortgage is, what um, buying your first home is. Uh, it's, it's informative. It, it's not going to give you everything that goes on with the process, but it, it should give you a better under, understanding of the loan process. We're going to have an insurance agent that's going to go through that process as well and the importance of having a uh, homeowner's insurance uh, once you become a homeowner. How soon should I start looking? I will say to you, if you want to purchase a home in the next six to eight months, I would start now. I would start these conversations now. Again, not only because it may take a little bit of time to get pre-approved, but it may take a little bit of time to find that home because things are, are tough out there and there's not enough inventory. It may take you and I a month, six months, you just don't know. First steps that home buyers should take uh, would be to meet with a loan officer just to go over what um, it is needed to obtain a loan. Uh, we're gonna go over uh, income, over credit report, over um, um, down payment needed to purchase their first home, any grant programs that we have out there that they may qualify for. So I would say that the first step would be to meet with a mortgage loan officer. My name is Jamie and I'm a personal loan officer at Landmark Credit Union. Landmark is holding this event to make it known to the community that we are willing to help you out for first home buying. Should I buy now or should I wait? My, my textbook answer is always, it's a horse apiece. So your interest rate's more than likely gonna be lower now than it is in a year and a half if our economy continues to do well and grow. I hope that people walk out feeling more comfortable in buying their first home. They have the first step into buying the first home and they feel more knowledgeable on what to do. And hopefully they stick with Landmark Credit Union in the process because our rates are very well and we're more for the community where we will help you feel comfortable in buying your first home. These are the questions, if you're going to shop around, these are the questions that you want to ask every lender to ensure that you are getting the best possible deal. Okay, so number one is the rate. That's a very common question. That's the most important question that people ask is, what is the rate? We want to make sure that you get the best possible deal. And so when you do call around, rates change every day. Um, if you call in the morning, one lender, and you call me in the afternoon, that could be a different rate for either party, not just me, for the other, the other lender as well. So when you call, try to call around the same amount of time, okay? FHA loans, it's, it's basically a government loan. Um, it is out there to help people with lower credit scores, uh, as low as 580, with a low down payment, which it would require a three and a half percent of the purchase price. Uh, Landmark Credit Union welcomes the Monk community and all the communities out there uh, to come in and learn about uh, the mortgage loan programs, the uh, auto loan programs, the checking, the savings, all the benefits that Landmark Credit Union would have to offer. For more information on future free home buying seminars, go to landmarkcu.com slash seminars. Stay with us. When we come back, we will have a health conversation with JC from the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association of the Medical College of Wisconsin about alcoholism. When it comes to starting your own business, it can be overwhelming and challenging. At the Hmong Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce, we understand how important it is to give you resources to build and expand your business. That's why we've designed our services to generate rapid results to help businesses of all sizes and across all industries. Hmong Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce, growing businesses in Wisconsin. Welcome back. According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, Wisconsin is among the top 10 of total alcohol consumed per capita. There are many health risks due to consuming too much alcohol. Let's join in as JC from the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association of the Medical College of Wisconsin talks with Don Yang about alcoholism. Welcome and please introduce yourself and what will we be discussing. 
Thank you. My name is JC, and I'm a first year medical student. Um, I'm part of the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association at MCW, and today we'll be talking about alcoholism. So what is alcohol and how does it affect the body? So alcohol is a drug, uh, most commonly in drinks like beer, wine, or liquor, and it is considered a biphasic depressant. So breaking that down, it means that when you drink a little bit, um, you're going to be feeling good and energized, but the more and more you drink, it can slow your body down and lead to symptoms like slurred speech or dizziness or inability to think or react quickly. Okay, so what should people know before they drink? So first of all, in Wisconsin, the legal drinking age is 21. You should not drink if you are pregnant or may become pregnant. This is because alcohol will hurt your baby and can lead to something called fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, this can lead to your baby having brain damage or delayed growth. Um, additionally, you should be careful if you are taking medications because they can have interactions with alcohol and lead to negative side effects. Um, especially medications like antibiotics or hypertension or diabetes medications. They can interact with alcohol and lead to negative side effects. Another thing you should know about drinking alcohol is that the CDC recommends um, one drink per day for women and two drinks per day for men. So how much is considered one serving of alcohol? So the definition of one drink is one 12 ounce beer, uh, one five ounce glass of wine, or one 1.5 ounce shot of liquor. So to break it down, it's like one can of beer, or one small cup of wine, or just like one shot of liquor. And that's considered one drink of alcohol. When we're out and about, I do notice that some people turn red when they consume alcohol. Why does it happen? So actually that's called alcohol flush reaction. And it is common in the Asian population. So this occurs because we don't have an enzyme in our body that's required to break down the alcohol. So when this happens, it can lead up to a buildup of a chemical called acetaldehyde, which causes you to turn red on your face, and it can also cause really bad liver damage. However, even if you don't turn red, you are still susceptible to liver damage and alcoholism as well too. My next question, what is alcoholism? Yeah, so alcoholism is when a person is addicted to alcohol. So addiction occurs on two levels. There's your psychological level or your mind and then your physiological level, which is your body. So when your mind is addicted to alcohol, it will always tell you, I want to drink, or it can be hard for you to stop drinking or say no to a drink. If you're physiologically or if your body is addicted to alcohol, when you don't get it, it might have a bad reaction like nausea or vomiting. You can feel anxious or be shaky. So what happens then when you drink too much? So actually, the more you drink, the more you can build a tolerance. So that means that you will need to drink more in order to achieve the same effects that you achieved before. So this obviously can lead to you drinking way too much alcohol and not even realizing it. One common consequence of drinking too much is cirrhosis of the liver. So this is when your liver builds up scar tissue and doesn't let it work very well. Um, some symptoms that accompany cirrhosis is bleeding or bruising very easily, weight loss, or jaundice, which is the yellowing of the skin or the eyes. Um, so keep in mind that cirrhosis is irreversible. So when you are damaging your liver, you can't fix it. Mm, that sounds very serious. Yeah. Additionally, as well, um, too much alcohol can lead to cancer, like cancer in your stomach or in your esophagus. Um, so it can be really scary. Um, another serious consequence of long-term drinking is called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. So this is when it affects your brain and it leaves you confused. It's hard for you to form new memories or remember old ones. Overall, I would just say drinking alcohol can lead to a lot of health problems um, like hypertension, diabetes, or psychological problems. Thank you so much, JC, for your time and for all of the valuable information today about alcoholism. Thank you, JC and John, for these important health information. For more information about PAMSA, you can contact them at apamsa.mcw at gmail.com. 
Stay with us. We'll be right back with Dr. Chia Bang to talk about her new book, Fly Until You Die, an oral history about Hmong pilots in the Vietnam War. At Hmong American Peace Academy, we know that education is the key to moving out of poverty. We know that without heritage, we are nothing. Hence, it's important that our scholars know who they are, where they come from, so they can be productive and contributing members of society. Hmong American Peace Academy honors the past and forges the future forever forward. Welcome back. During the Vietnam War, more than 300,000 Hmong people lived in Laos. Of that 300,000, 19,000 were recruited to the CIA secret operation known as the guerrilla units. But did you know there were also Hmong pilots who flew combat missions during the Vietnam War? Today, Nyanjo Milwaukee sits down with Dr. Chia Vang, Associate Vice Chancellor, Division of Global Inclusion and Engagement, and Professor to talk about her new book. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. Today we have a special guest, uh, her name is Dr. Chia Vang, and can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure, well I'm Chia Vang and I'm a history professor at UW-Milwaukee. I'm also the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Inclusion and Engagement, and I direct the um, Hmong Diaspora Studies at UWM. Well, welcome to uh, the studio here, and today we're here to talk about this amazing book that mm -hmm. you've you written. You know, what inspired you to write this book? This book came out because during the Vietnam War, uh, there was a special operation that the U.S. Air Force trained some Hmong pilots to be fighter pilots. Half of them died, but many of them came to the U.S., and they had a reunion in 2012. And when they came to the reunion, they looked at each other, and some of them were um, in wheelchairs, they were dying. They decided that um, they wanted to make sure that their history didn't die with them. So I decided that I would help them. So it, it wasn't my idea. I first was just going to do some interviews, help them to document a little bit. But then as I worked with them, and uh, when they agreed that they would work with me to, to engage in this project, then I went all over the country to interview as many people as possible. But this was a really important story for me to tell because these were the elite of Hmong society at the time. And all of the men who went to this program, they were all trained by American pilots. That's why I, I wanted to tell this story. And again, it wasn't my idea. It was their attempt to keep this story alive. And as a historian, I was just the person who was able to help them carry that forward. Fly until you die. How would you come up with that title? I came up with this title because most American pilots or American soldiers who came to Southeast Asia, they have a tour or two, and then they get to come home. There's an exit strategy, right? They're not stuck there. But for the Hmong pilots and for the soldiers as well, too. But for the Hmong pilots, once they finish training, they can only go back and work in Laos, right? And they, they, they don't stop working, right? They fly until they either die or are injured. So that's where the title comes from, Fly Until You Die. How much of an impact did, did these Hmong pilots have during the war? The T-28 is really the A model, it's really a trainer plane, right? But they modified this plane, this aircraft, to be a fighter plane, right? So they added, you know, guns and bomb, you know, for them to carry bomb. So when the South Vietnamese Army was giving um, better planes, uh, then fighter jets, then these planes were transferred to the other theater, meaning in, in, in Laos and Cambodia. So these T-28 planes were great, they're slow, but they could prov they can go really low. So this is one of the ways in which the, uh, the Hmong pilots really contributed. I'm sure through all your interviews with the pilots, um, what's one interview that is most compelling to you? Mm -hmm. Well, every story, I think that as individuals, we all have um, stories that are compelling, right? And we might be at the same place at the same time, and something happens. But depending on who we are, we will interpret it differently mm -hmm. based on our viewpoints, our values, right? Pao Yang, uh, he was the POW, right? He was, he was shot down. He fell into enemy territory. He was put in prison camp, assumed to be dead, right, for years. But he eventually he survives, and there's there's a lot of tension in that story too because he was married, and then when he was shot down, he was presumed dead after the war ended. He didn't return, 
And so his wife and child, they thought he had died. And in Hmong culture, potu one hupli, right? Or to have a soul calling ceremony to free his soul. So he was presumed dead. And then she goes on to, you know, remarry. And then he comes back. So that story is so heart-wrenching. But it, that's not even the most heart-wrenching part for me. Is like I was at his house in Georgia. And he, I interviewed him one evening. And we got to the part where he was describing what happened to him during prison camp, right? And as a pilot, they were considered the highest crime, right? They're pilots, they drop bombs. So the enemy considered them really high crimes, right? So very long story short, there's so much. But um, when he was describing, you know, that, that, that environment where um, they, they kept the prisoners in little compounds, and, you know, you go to the bathroom there, you, um, you know, you take your pee, your poop, and then you go and discard them later, uh, and you eat there, and then your friends are sick and they die in front of you. So just describing those was so emotional for him, and then transferring to me as the interviewer. So we had to stop the interview, and then we would continue the conversation the next day. Going forward, I want people to be proud. This book isn't the solution for everything, but a book like this and you know, their contributions, we should definitely be proud that uh, we are here and their sacrifices were not for nothing. Going forward, we're going to define, you know, the future for ourselves, that we're not going to just continue to think of ourselves as, as victims of these political and historical uh, forces, but then we are actively creating a better future for ourselves. Well, thank you for joining us today and, you know, Congratulations on this book. Um, I know you said it's everyone's book, but you know it took you to get it done. So yeah, yeah. thank you um, uh, for joining us in the studio today. And uh, everyone, check out the book if you. Uh, yeah, when is it coming out? Yep, it, it's it's published. It published on May, March fifth. Okay. So it will be. Um, it's available everywhere. You know, you can go to Amazon. You okay. can go to the Oxford University Press website. Um, unfortunately, it's only available in hardcover, so it's, it is $74, but um, I don't have any control over that, so, um, and, and the money doesn't all go to me, just so people know that I'm not going to get rich by writing an academic book, but if people will come to the event, then they can get it for um, a cheaper price, because as the author, then I, I can I have a discount, so um, if you want to pay a little less and still get the book signed by all these pilots, then uh, come to the event. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, check out the book and check out the event on April 12th. Thank you, Dr. Chia Bang, for your time and congratulations on your new book that will be a part of Hmong history forever. For more information about the War, Memory, and Healing Community Conversation and Book Celebration event, contact Dr. Chia Bang at bangcy at uwm.edu or call 414-229-1101. We appreciate your time for joining our March edition of Nyojong Milwaukee TV, the first over-the-ear Hmong television show in southeastern Wisconsin on WMLW The M. Follow and like us on Facebook and Instagram at Nyojong Milwaukee TV and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Nyojong MKE. Before we say goodbye, we would like to leave you with this message. Remember that the happiest people are not those getting more, but those giving more. Until next time, may your community continue to be blessed and inspired. <laughs>